And so now I want to welcome everyone to the Brookline Booksmith's author event series today featuring Jade Song. And we are going to be discussing their new book, Chlorine, and it's in conversation with Yan Gu. My name is Jessica Young. I'm a bookseller here at Brookline Booksmith. And I, we are in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you are familiar with our store, welcome back. And if this is your first time to our community, uh, welcome. We are very excited to have you here with us today and making us your independent bookstore uh, with your attendance and this book purchase very possible. It helps us all feel happy and loved. So Yan Ge is the author of 13 books, including six novels. She has received numerous awards, including the prestigious uh, Mao Dun Literature Prize, which is the best young writer. Um, she was named People's Literature Magazine as one of 20 first literature masters in China, and her work has been translated into English, French, and German, among other, many other languages. Her writing has been published in the New York Times, The Stinging Fly, The Irish Times, TLS, Stand Magazine, Brick, and Being Various, New Irish Short Stories. She was a recipient of the UEA International Award in 2018-19, and her debut English language story collection elsewhere shall be published this year. She is here to help us with a wonderful uh, moderating of the event with our featured author, Jade Song, who is, of course, a writer, art director, and artist. Her debut novel, Chlorine, is forthcoming uh, in 2023 from Willow Morrow, and that's why we are here to purchase the book today, right? And so her writing has been nominated for numerous best of year anthologies and has appeared in Electric Literature, Hobart, Quale Journal, Waxwing, and elsewhere. Their art direction work has been awarded by and featured in the Shorties Campaign US, the Smarties S by Southwest or SXSW, um, uh, Advertising Week, Bustle, and Adage, among others, and she resides in Brooklyn and considers Pittsburgh and Beijing home, too. Uh, they enjoy cooking tofu, it seems, supporting friends, looking at paintings, and slowly translating uh, Chinese literature, which is so much wonderful work, and we are so happy to listen to all of them, so I'm going to disappear and hand it over to our wonderful authors this evening. Disappeared literally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, so uh, should I say something to, to express how much of a fangirl I've become um, of Chlorine since reading it? <laughs> and then oh. Jade is going to do a little bit of reading, I think. Um, yeah, so um, I read this whole book in about three days, which is a miracle to me because I always kind of put books, I kind of like to shuffle a pile of books while I read it, so I'd never really commit to a book. And I seriously committed to this one. <laughs> and I really, really enjoyed reading it. Um, Chlorine is a novel of many, many things. And um, you'll see like people will say it's a coming of age story. And I think it's a story that explores our complicated relationship with our body. And it's a tale of immigrants. It's kind of like a sports fiction. And also it's the unnerving fantasy about metamorphosis. And also most Im impressively to me, it is a book that dexterously utilizes the idea of fiction as in the so-called reality in fiction could be constantly reshaped. I finished reading this book, couldn't decide if it was, an un un if it, it was a case of an unreliable narrator or a quote and unquote unreliable or magical reality. And that to me is the most profound aspect of chlorine. And so I'm so excited to be able to have this um, Q&A with like conversation with Jay today and have so many questions. <laughs> but first of all, Jade, would you like to read a little bit from the book? And so people who haven't read the book would um, get a taste of it? Yes, of course. And thank you so much for those kind words. Um... And thank you, of course, everyone for coming again. I know it's a weekend, so thank you for being here on the screen and feel free to pop in with any questions at all or any comments. Uh, we can make this feel more like a friendly little gathering rather than um, something virtual. But yeah, I'll read for a little bit and then um, we can delve into Q&A and then we can open it up. But cool. OK. All right, I will read from page 10. OK. Do you understand the world I lived in? how my mutilations were a gift. As we delve into my tale, I must caution you, every mermaid is different. Some tales are made of shimmering scales and some like mine are made of skin and thread and knots. 
Popular discourse may force you to assume all mermaids have the same experiences, opinions, looks, and emotions, but I assure you everyone has their unique points of origin contributing to their mythology and the overall canon. The Little Mermaid for a man, the Starbucks mermaid for corporate co coffee, Nuwa for friendship. My own reasons were neither for partnership nor for profit. Mine were simply a slow uncovering of my true self. While the people I swam with and their behavior can be considered catalysts to my transformation, their impact was, in the end, minor. Neither my coach, nor my best friend, nor my parents, nor my teammates, nor their viewings of me as an object of intense perverse affection can be listed as the main reasons. I transformed because I became who I was meant to be all along. A mermaid who thrives in fresh water, chlorine water, seawater, ever adaptable if I had my tail. Back then, I was a girl, a body of water, a liminal state of being, a hybrid on the cusp of evolution. Now I am Ren Yu. I am person fish, I am mermaid, and so goes my tale of becoming. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Amazing. I, I was, um, although I've read those bits, but I, I was really taken in by, by the rhythm and the musicality and then how like lyrical and both lyrical and powerful the voice is. And I really think you've such a magical voice, like this, this voice of the narrator, like I was saying, and um, you know, like sometimes you feel like um, it should be like self delusional, but sometimes I think because precisely because her voice is so convincing and passionate, and you really kind of start believing her, not believing her. I think for me, it's always like this tug of war between the two forces, which is actually something that propels me to turn the pages constantly. And it's such a great, like, you know, to create this kind of voice. So first question is, is a bit of a cliche. It's, um, I just, um, I was really just amazed, like how many different elements were like really in this novel. And I wonder what inspires you to write this novel. How did the novel come about? Like, why did you, how did you decide you wanted to have this project? Yeah, um, so I I tend to actually think in visions um, rather than sentences, I think because I have a stronger background in the visual um, because of my day job as an art director and just because I got my start as an artist, as a painter, um, an illustrator more. So this image, I mean, I can't reveal the climax of the novel, but it did come to me, the vision of somebody trans. Uh, transcending in a locker room into becoming a mermaid um, and I just I couldn't let go of it until I figured out her story and how she got there and what happens next um, and this came in 2020 um, and I had started writing for the first time in January 2020 I didn't I hadn't like conceived as writing as a creative practice or an artistic thing I could do until 2020 um, and so having this like newfound language for the ability to write and having this like vision in my head of this girl who I just like needed to figure out how she became a mermaid mm -hmm. um that all came together for me and I knew her story was longer than a short story and that she deserved an entire novel and that's how it came to be mm, it's amazing I was just thinking about the similarity what as you were saying you know how you kind of envisioned the climax which we will not review <laughs> first like that image and then that inspires you so you're writing towards that and I think similarly for us as readers because the story kind of pretty much from like on set it tells you oh I would become a mermaid this is how I become a mermaid so then this is the idea we were kind of like the you know it's kind of like a spoiler is there but sometimes I feel having that um, rather than being like a revelation rather it could become like a very powerful narrative suspense I think in this story it really served that way because that was the although it's kind of like a brief mentioning of it but it's like this kind of um you couldn't decide if it's some it's if, if it's like you know again if it's like um a figurative image or a realistic or like a literal image a literal thing that happens as we I read that at the beginning so I kind of feel it's really interesting how the the journey of you like discovering and creating this story kind of overlaps and kind of coincides with uh, the journey of us getting to know the story and it's really nice that way and um, second question 
And I'm like a very stiff. My <laughs> my interviewing style is like being very stiff. So this no, is no, no, you're wonderful. Absolutely this is wonderful. my stiff proceeding because I like, <laughs> I all I never could find like the a very soft transition to say, oh let's like I was like okay number two now here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and so the second question is that uh, I was so uh, intrigued by like when I was reading about there was this um like um passage um a few passages about you know like all the mermaids like historically so the arch archetypal mermaids and I was really intrigued by that and it's like a wonderful mixed cohort of like Western mermaids and Chinese and in Eastern mermaids. And in particular, the Chinese goddess Niwa came up and then returned to the story later, like repeatedly. Uh, we see Ren praying to Niwa before her transformation. And Niwa is this Chinese goddess in, uh, who kind of lived <laughs> in the antiquity, uh, who has like a woman's face and a serpent's body. And it's often seen as a symbol, I think, of a, a matriarchal society. Um, and just so interesting by like how Niwa, instead of like a mermaid mermaid, we have the mermaid mermaid, but like I, I suppose to me that really stood out for like again to be praying to her um before you know her big transformation. And um, so could you talk a little bit more about like the image of Niwa and um and the significance of Niwa in this novel? Yeah, um I love that question. So I do think that there there is the book uh called Penguin Book of Mermaids that is an excellent uh collection and they're credited in the acknowledgement. Um, the authors, but they did a very amazing job of collecting mermaid lore throughout different cultures um, and different time periods. And once you dive into exploring what the mermaid could be, you realize that there's always been this sort of, as you said, matriarchal kind of feminine deity power that lives in the ocean or breathes water um, and has seduced humans, um, any gender, throughout time um, and is this sort of like mythological monstrous being that everybody seems to be fascinated with um, and you can actually see that in popular culture now today um, like chlorine's been featured in some roundups where um, they're listing all the different sort of mermaid uh, mermaid art that's been coming out recently like Florence and the Machines new um, album is about mermaids there's a new little mermaid disney adaptation coming out um harry styles even had like a music video recently i think for a sushi buffet song or something where he's like half man half fish um and i just i think there was a lot of like fascination and beauty around that sort of like mythological being and how it can come to life so i feel like in a way it's less about like the mermaid and the mermaid image itself and more just about the monstrous and how humans can like mm. elevate and transcend into something greater than themselves and in time and in history that's always been this sort of like god which is what Nuwa could be um especially for ren and i think someone like ren who kind of lives in between cultures in a way um, and her character, again, lives between human and lives between fish. She's very used to kind of praying, which praying like the word itself is a very like kind of Western concept in a way. Um, but she's very used to speaking in between. Um, and I think even if she lives in America and she um, knows that she's not fully like a human being per se, she fixates on characters like Nuwa and like Fei Wong in the novel um that also kind of live in between and kind of live in this like mythological sort of characterization that she seeks for herself hmm. yeah I, I think it like if we were kind of doing like literary criticism one on one <laughs> it's kind of this this image of like, like half human half fish and then this state of like living in between and I think it's like a perfect matching metaphor um but obviously I think that's that's like too obvious but also like it's it's really smart it's like really nice this way it's kind of like I feel like reading this book oftentimes I had to pause and ask myself is this like sort of in the literal sense or is this like a metaphor I think so many things were like used as like a metaphor but also in the literal sense like this double meanings of like different actions and how like when she swim I'm gonna say it wrong breaststroke <laughs> And her coach had tie bound her uh, legs together. I thought that was such a like it was such like a visceral revelation. And then like how this is this this is how she's being um this is what she's good at. You know she swim this particular one, and then how that's related. And it's like a metaphor for that for the later transformation and how that coins like echoes with their inner identity. Yeah. Anyway, 
Trent, now we're going to question number three. Can I ask a question? Um, did you think it yeah. was more literal or more metaphorical? Because I do feel like... Um, you mean for, um, for, for the fish? For the transformation. For the uh, that's my question. I have this. <laughs> this is, please be patient, Jay. This is listed as question number eight. So just <laughs> wait for it. <laughs> now let's go step by step for our question number three. <laughs> so question number three is kind of related to that. Those are like those are things I kind of, I, I I feel like I reacted kind of in a visceral way, like most um a strongest like uh, when I was reading it. So it's um all those descriptions um of bodies, like how they kind of wrestle in the swimming pool, and how when she dives in, and then like how. The, like the body like touches and reacts towards and fights against the water. And, and th there's like this very tense but intimate relationship between Ren and her body. And so I, I, I'm like really fascinated, like mesmerizing you know, all the swimming scene and how like, you know, the swimmer's body negotiates with the water. And and also um, I really like this, um, I had a dog here, is it? Is this is a really nice passage, like, there were like so many um, examples um, throughout the book, but I thought this one was um, after her dad left um, and then started to uh, develop this habit of like um, a compulsive habit where I licked my skin and chewed my ha hair. Um, and then this is like how she kind of, you know, kind of, I don't know, expresses this kind of um, her emotions through kind of this uh, connection, reconnecting with her body in this very intense and a bit weird way. And when Ren took the summer job to be a lifeguard in the swimming pool, and she met S, am I saying the name right? And whom she described as, and I quote, um, S owned um, a body more a vehicle for their own pleasure than a body carrying scars on the surface. And I really, really love that, like to the, the dual aspect of seeing the body both as like, um, as like a vehicle, as like something that enables you, but also as something that traps you in. And I think that dual sensation aspects of like a body. So I'm extremely intrigued by the notion of like the body in this novel and the multitude ways of examining and reimagining it. So I just wanted to hear, would you like to uh, elaborate a little bit on the notion of the body and what role does it play, do you think, in your novel? Yeah, um, I feel like the body and its different the different ways that the body as a theme can be explored comes through in many different ways in the novel um, because there's the body horror aspect um, which is a very like it's a it's a very interesting genre of horror because it is horror in a way what you're doing what the main character does to their body but in a way it's also very freeing because you're allowing your body to become everything that you like imagined it would be it would be um, and even if that is necessarily again monstrous, it is very freeing to be to let your body just be the monster that it was always meant to be. Um, but I do think like the body horror angle really shines in a lot of the athleticism um, and the things that athletes have to do, especially when you're a young girl coming of age and your body is just like fraught with all these changes from menstruation to being viewed through other people's eyes, which in itself can be very traumatic um, for a lot of people growing up. And so I think like the athletic lens combined with the body horror lens really just makes it like this very like confining and claustrophobic um, sort of atmosphere in the novel. I do think like, I do love athletic delusion and discipline. And I think it really shines in a lot of body horror movies like Black Swan, for example, um, just because athletes are forced to constantly like negotiate with their body and put their bodies on display and also have their bodies be um, controlled from coaches to teammates into this like sort of pinnacle of perfect athleticism. Um, so I think Ren, especially as a character in the novel and um, as she grows up and realizes that she wants to truly own her body and have it become what she has always in what she has always envisioned, not her coach. That's a very freeing aspect for her. And even though it comes at the cost of a sort of bloody transformation, it becomes her. And I do think it's very freeing in the end. Mm, mm, mm. I personally was really, maybe because I haven't, like, I'm like, if there's a spectrum, like, the, on this end is like the athletics I'm like there you know I'm kind of like super awkward <laughs> with like I'm incompetent when it comes to like body uh but like I was so um 
like struck every time like with all the description of Ren's muscle like how like there was like the side of her body and then all those muscles and I was like it's like a typical description towards like say a, a young woman character but it's also very empowering like all those descriptions and it gives me goosebumps and I really and I, yeah I thought every time when those kind of descriptions or those kind of um uh, sections come up I feel like I feel kind of like alive a little bit more alive, <laughs> like a visceral way like kind of. I really enjoy reading those bits actually. Um, and the, the other thing I want to talk about um, is that um, the structure of the novel, and I quite like the structure um, um, of the novel. And I feel like uh, some of them are like quite innovative, 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 but also, you know, it's kind of um, seamless. You don't feel like, oh, I wanted to do something new. It's kind of like very natural, but also, you know, you, you get all those, like, for example, you have um, all the letters from Kathy um, that were like interspersed along the main narrative threads. And those letters like reminding me of the tradition of um, epistemology, uh, epis sorry, <laughs> Epistolary uh, novels allow us to kind of glimpse into not only like Kathy's point of view, but also I think it's very in interesting is that we're glimpsing, we're glimpsing into um, after we finish the novel, we realize we're actually seeing uh, the future uh, via uh, when we were reading Kathy's letters, um, because that is the future where after Ren swims away um, in the creek. And so I think that again, like a dual aspect of like how the, the letters will serve all those purposes. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, had it always been the plan to have the letters there or um, did you decide, like, why did you decide to write the chapters um, of Kathy's letters? And, the, and also, you know, why they are where they are? Is this kind of like something you always wanted to do at the beginning or did it kind of come about like halfway through or? Yeah, um, so, in the first draft, few drafts of the novel, it was mostly anger, to be honest. Um, I think it was, I mean, a lot of the novel felt like a very, when I was writing it, it felt very cathartic. Um, it mm -hmm. felt like it came from a place of anger. And then once I continued revising it, I realized I just wanted a lot more love and tenderness, um, even if that love and tenderness is kind of corrupted in a way because they're not communicating properly. Um, but yeah, I think I just I really wanted more love and tenderness in the mm. novel because in between the moments of anger and pain, there are moments of like joy and love that I think are important for everybody to experience and to acknowledge. And I think especially for Ren, who doesn't want to be human, I think um, having that thing that grounds her, having that love and tenderness that comes from human interaction that grounds her. Uh, was very important to highlight and they came through in letters I think because one like writing letters is a very romantic thing especially now with like digital communication like I can whip out my phone and just like text anyone call someone um, but to sit down and like write a letter to somebody and like put the stamp on stick it in the mailbox etc um, especially through postcards um, or letters because when you live apart from somebody, like how are you going to express that sort of love and time and care that a text message um, can do so easily? And in a lot of ways that comes through in letter writing. So the fact that Kathy takes the time to write these letters to Ren mm -hmm. when she doesn't even know if Ren will receive them because Ren is a mermaid living in the water now. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> um, but I think that just really expresses a kind of time and care and love that comes through from Kathy um, and that mm -hmm. I hope readers might kind of feel in their heart when they read and also perhaps maybe take the time to send a letter to a loved one who doesn't live in the same place as them because it is I truly think it's a form of act and love and care and like a lot of me and my loved ones now like we send postcards when we're traveling or we send letters if we're not living in the same place and it's just like it's such a joy to like look in the mailbox and see that letter there um, and yeah, I just really wanted to include it in the novel because that's a form of communication that I think is very beautiful. Mm, yeah, yeah, I I feel that the I really agree you said about the aspect of like having the tenderness and love like coming from Kathy. And to me, you know, the climax of this um, of the novel, like the transformation is obviously like it's really strong. And then I, I had to put it down actually when I was reading that bit, I was like, ah. <laughs> I had to like go away, like drink some hot tea and then came back. <laughs> uh, but it, that was like, you know, the, the strongest, but also it's like explosive and it's quite dark in a way. But also I think um, 
on the other hand, I in my head, like the way I see it, I feel there's like a another climax is when Kathy, it's like all spoilers, I'm sorry guys. Uh, when Kathy took Ren away and then, you know, we all thought oh, Ren was gonna just go away into the creek and then she said, oh, stop. And then at that point, like even as a reader, I was like, just please let her go. Um, but then they kind of um, stayed and had this really like romantic and also just sweet and very slow. Like I'm talking about the narrative pace, like and at that point, um, but like, I feel like that kind of, um, although having like almost like the opposite energy to the thing of transformation, but it also serves as like a climax precisely for what you were saying about like, it is like the struggle and then all the things and you know, the the burden Ren is carrying and, and then the struggle she has, but also at the same time, like the love and tenderness. And precisely, I think that's like the pinnacle of that when they were having that picnic. And I, um, after reading it, like after that's finished, I was like, oh, this totally makes sense um, and for that to be there. And I think that, uh, so I really agree, like for, for what you're saying about this, like the, the, there are two sides of it and you really wanted to push that up, like the love and tenderness. And I really felt that um, through Kathy. Um, another thing I thought is so interesting, like as a narrative device, um, is that this novel, you know, there's a you. <laughs> and and that, and especially I think uh, when it begins, like, it begins with you, isn't it? The second person narration. Um, so then um, I, for the, I, like when I began to read it, when I started to read it and I immediately, I felt like this was going to be like you throughout, but then you disappears, but then you came back, right? You came back at various points. And I think most mo like what struck me um, the most is when you came back when Ren was in this, it's like all spoilers, sorry. When Ren was in kind of like a difficult situation and, and then you came back to say, is this you, like the second narration came back, sorry, as a device. Um, so I kind of feel, again, like, I think it's such an interesting and skillful choice for you to be used, a second person narration to be used in this novel, both as a tool of, like, engaging the reader. It's like at the beginning to say, you are not here, like, and then you kind of jaws the reader in by using second person narration. But at times, especially for those, like, really kind of um, emotionally kind of quite intense thing, and you were used as a way to kind of detach the reader from the fictive present and to give us a room to kind of interpret, but also kind of a, to give Ren, give the narrator like um, sort of um, the space, like the temporal space to have this looking back effect. But then I think almost making it more like complicated and poignant. Um, so I really like, I'm kind of like a narrative nerd, obviously. <laughs> and so I just wanted to know um, what, what, what are your thoughts on like this, um, introducing of the second person narration again did you like thought about like say the beginning I think is like a very strong like the beginning is like it just very enticing draws you in mm -hmm. and immediately and so did that so when did that come about like did you kind of decide you're going to do that like the introducing this second person narration um at the early stage of like writing this novel or like did it come later or why did you decide to do that interrogation this is all <laughs> No, I appreciate that. I think it's a very interesting question. And I think I have three different ways of answering it. One is that I really enjoy writing and reading in second person because it frees both the writer and the reader from thinking in terms of like gender and name and character. Mm -hmm. It allows for like a very interesting, immersive kind of way of reading that frees you from like certain human conventions, uh, which is probably too why I chose to use it in the novel. Um, I think especially considering Ren considers herself and is um, a sort of god or monster in a way. Um, and if I am thinking about a god or monster, how they might talk to a human being who is the reader, um, they would probably re speak to them in a sort of like condescending um, mythical way that of course requires you and requires a sort of like distancing that second person allows um, because it's setting like I am I, I am the main character and you are you mm. and you are the reader and you are here to listen to mm. me. Um, and I imagine that if I was talking to a god or monster, that's how they would treat me very condescendingly, mm. um, and which, of course, they can totally do because they are um, better than a human being. Um, but third, I think it's a really interesting way that you frame this question, because frankly, like, I don't have I have I've never taken a traditional writing class. Um, and I again, like I didn't even consider writing something that people did until 2020. 
um, even though I had always loved to read. Um, and so a lot of the choices I made, especially in my early work, they weren't conscious choices. Um, they were just me exploring and me writing. And I still remember like when I first called my agent on the phone to like, cause they wanted to sign, et cetera. They were using all these like fancy writing tech, writing words like epistolatory, which I still can't even pronounce, which I think you cited um, and like second person, et cetera. And I'm always, even today, I'm still like, okay, second person is you. First person is I, <laughs> third person is because again, like I, I think because I had been, I had always considered myself a reader, not a writer. And so these like writing terms and these conscious narrative choices, like they feel still very foreign to me. Um, and it's only after I complete like several drafts of the same story when I realized that like, this is why I made this choice. Um, and I think I, I don't necessarily know if that's like good writing advice, to be honest. Um, I just know like, that's the way I work. And um, that to me, like, the, the formal like writing structural techniques to think in those ways in very early drafting I think to me like just being an artist and knowing how I work that's very foreign to me but I appreciate the like examination and um I think it is a good thing in the end of the day to like <laughs> understand why somebody might make these craft choices but for me it's just it's very hard for my brain to think yeah about. that's so that's amazing because um Obviously, like as you were saying, I realized how silly my question was. But but at the same time, um, the reason I asked about you is because for me, it's like it's not an easy choice. I think if I were writing anything, I find like using second person sort of a signals that you're just going full on experimental or you're like it kind of like being almost like too radical. <laughs> And so for me, like second person is always like something I always I'm really like I know I have I know a number of writers and um, I, re I read some of writers, number of writers and also I know some of them per um, in person like and they do very well second person narration and it's something like I really aspire to but I couldn't do it so I was like so interested in when I saw those and and I just really and I and I find it it's so interesting because like the way you said, it's kind of like, it just very naturally, you kind of decided you're going to do that. But it seems to me, it's like this bit about like, I was so impressed by this bit, like page um, 111 when, you know, Ren had this, this, I don't, I don't want to spoil you <laughs> anything had this situation with Luke and then afterwards, and then we switched to you and you says, it goes, you want every detail so you can make appropriate judgments on the participant uh, on the participants of such ambiguous events. You should you would like to decide whether I deserve your pity. And that's like goes on to say, I will give you one scenario, I will give you another scenario. Would now would you now feel better for me? And the actual it's kind of like I thought it was such a bold and experimental, but like really successfully, like this this using of you and using that to kind of um almost like suddenly turning this from beyond like a piece of fiction but also a social commentary and and I thought I was like so excited by that I thought oh that's like so daring but also like works so well in this particular scenario and um, so I kind of highlighted it <laughs> I really wanted to ask you and that's so interesting because obviously I mean when we read the when we're when we're asked to interview the author, we think about all those things in kind of those narratology terms. But like honestly, when I write, I just like type up things. I don't really think about those things. Yeah. So okay, let's go to question number. Let me see where we are. It's like okay. Let me first check the time. Oh, I don't know if we have time to ask so many questions. Okay, I'm gonna. Shall we just go to um? This I really want to ask you. Actually, it's a very quick question before we go to the big one. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is uh, I just I want to know what do you think is the biggest challenge you has writing this novel and how did you resolve it <laughs> well, uh, oh biggest challenge I had writing this novel and how did I resolve it to be honest I think writing the novel was not hard because again I 
like I I have always loved to read like books growing up were my best friends like my mom would take me to the library every weekend and like I would just like check out as many books as I was allowed and I would just like read all of them and like I I still to this day like I love books if I have a book I'm happy and I loved books so much that to consider that books were written by humans, by authors, that authors were humans would have ruined that love for me because humans had always let me down, but books never had. Um, so when I decided to be a writer, it was not a decision, like I wanna be a published author. It was more just like, I know when I'm an artist and I know that to like be alive and want to be alive, I need to make art. Um, and so writing just became this like interesting artistic practice for me to explore. Um, and I think because I had had such that like, a uh, long reading background I think I kind of just like understood instinctively how a narrative story in English would come to be um and so frankly the writing itself was not difficult um because as again again as an artist I knew that no matter what you're trying to make you need many different iterations you need to like sit down and like write the thing out you need to like spend time toward it you need the discipline um I think it was more so honestly the publishing aspect that was mm. like the most difficult part of this um I, I I I was wildly unprepared for the publishing industry and like what it puts you through um and I think like again I have really great people on my side like I love my agent um my writing group is like a writing family at this point like and I love my friends but I think just like the aspect of having to learn how to like sell your work and talk about your work and go through like very public facing things when I'm naturally like a very introverted person, et cetera. I think that that's been very difficult. Um, and I think it's better now that the book has been out, um, like I think three and a half weeks now by now. Um, but in general, like, yeah, the publishing, publishing was really rough. <laughs> <laughs> and I think honestly, there was no way to resolve it other than like understand that this is what I want. Like it really forced me to take a step back and was like, I, am, I feel like I'm going through hell. Do I want to go through this again? And the answer was yes, I do want to keep writing. I do want to publish more books because like at the end of the day, like making art and writing is like what keeps me alive and what brings me closer to people. And like mm -hmm. hearing especially what like young queer Asians have to say about the book and how it like made them feel seen in a lot of ways. Like mm -hmm. I think that at the end of the day is what is most important, not not like glory or money. And if you do want glory and money, don't become a writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are way easier ways to do that um but yeah at the end of the day like yeah I think there was no way to resolve it other than ask myself truly is this what I want and the answer was yes and so yeah that's that's so moving thank you so much for sharing that because um I think I definitely have the same problem like I'm I have been going through and I am going through kind of like the same journey what you're describing it's just so difficult to think about like to have to talk about Anyway, let's go to the big question before. Wait, the but you published out. 13 books. Does it get easier? <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. I don't think it gets easier. And it <laughs> always is just not um yeah. Anyway, and I just I, I'm so excited for like asking you this question. I'm gonna ask the question. <laughs> very goofy, sorry. Um like I just mentioned um this actually when I was like sort of setting it up like saying how much of a big fan I am and towards this novel and for me the biggest narrative suspense is the mermaid herself we were told at the very beginning of the story that Ren turns into a mermaid and this is like probably at like page, on page two or something yes page two and then she says I burst into being when I was 17 years old I became a mermaid not as a pearl in the clamshell clamshell but as a girl in the locker room shower stall at the University of a Peaceboro pool during my junior year of high school. So that was like told to us, like just there. But then throughout the story, I was trying to decide if this transfer transformation is figurative or literal. And when we actually arrived at this incredibly beautiful and chilling scene of Ren's transformation, our uncertainty only deepened. In spite of the feeling that I might have encountered a case of unreliable narrator, a tragically unhinged young girl, um, I was lured in again and again by her compelling and passionate narration, just like the mermaid's songs, and that I ended up buying into her story repeatedly, but then kind of being drawn out from it, thinking, no, that can't be true. Um, but then towards the end, like you were asking me, I felt 
I almost like have this like double reality in one reality, like she is a mermaid and the story is set in such a fictional world, although ostensibly identical to our reality, but that could host that reality. This fictional reality could host like magical creatures who live and thrive in water. Um, but on the other hand, you could just interpret it as like this girl who's like an unreliable narrator from on set. And this would, you know, just like, you were kind of using, you know, the realistic logics to kind of assess what happened. So, um, I, yeah, so that's what I, I actually, I really wanted to ask you this if, if, and also I feel a bit bad for like pressing the author when we have, we as reader have like a question or like, tell me what it is. So I feel very bad for doing that to you, Jade. But I do wonder, is this kind of like a double vision or double reality of the story? Is my over-interpretation or something you designed uh, from the beginning? Uh, what is your take? Uh, on the ending of the story and uh, what is the truth of um, Ren the mermaid or is there more than one truth so what's so I'm pressing the author to say tell me what it is <laughs> I do oh wow um I do think it's the last bit of what you said that there are many different realities I will say as a person as a as I will say as um, the author, I, I feel like I can't give a concrete answer, yes or no, <laughs> but I will say, like, I think that I personally, as a writer, as a person, as a human being, feel more comfortable with people who are queer, um, and I don't just mean that in terms of, like, sexual attraction. I, I view that as um, a way of understanding that there are multiple realities and that sometimes to like mythify yourself and to mythify your loved ones is a way to understand your reality in a better way that because the reality that you've been presented in your past life is not the reality you want um and I think that mm -hmm. sort of freedom especially in terms of queerness especially in terms of being somebody who is who does not want to prescribe to what society tells you, you have to be, you have to do, you have to act. Um, just accepting that sort of freedom and accepting that there can be many different realities for someone within one life that itself is very freeing. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if the mermaid transformation is a metaphor. I don't know if there's a concrete answer, but I will say that it is freedom and that itself is what I hope readers take away from it, that there can be many realities for yourself and you don't have to share it. Um, but as long as like you understand that you are trying to move to the truest, most honest version of the person mm. you want to be, like that in itself is a worthwhile life, I suppose. Yeah, oh, that's really beautifully said and very moving. I, 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 I finished this novel like thinking, this is so profound because it kind of it really kind of understands this novel like utilizes to the most extreme the idea of fiction because it's precisely like you know the the multiple multitudes of realities is kind of like you know is this how we why we write fiction why fiction is important because then in the end i i agree with you is that i think it should be like an an open ending of like what actually happened and that's the beauty of it because it's in the fictional world and we could just interpret it freely. And um, yeah, and I think that's kind of sense of multitudes of realities and towards the end, like how the ending kind of really sings that. And it just, yeah. So I see Jessica, so I should wrap up. <laughs> but I just want to thank you for uh, writing this book and um, for letting me to, to send me this book and to like give me this opportunity to read this book. I think I've learned a lot and through talking to you today, I think I've learned more and there's a lot for me to chew on and really thank you so much. I feel very happy for this. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. And yeah, you've been an inspiration. And I think Jeremy is here from what I saw. Of I know. I saw his name. I was like, I can't talk now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love your work, truly. And if anyone has oh, not read Jan's work, you should because it's amazing. So we actually don't have any questions from the audience at this moment. So if there are other questions that you would like to ask, feel free to go forward. And if you're an audience member who does have a question, like please put it into either the chat or the Q&A at this point. Um, and I will more than happily, you know, 
ask them to Jade. So I'm going to go back on mute and y'all can continue talking. <laughs> okay, I have um, I have like um, not a real question, but it's a bit of a like a gossip. <laughs> <laughs> like wanting to know more gossip i i was so struck by again it's i think it's so interesting because i'm not uh, from the states you know i've lived i've lived there like briefly but really i don't really know like and i think it's such a such a it's like on film like what what i mean is like if you watch like a in the u.s film which like features like a bunch of teenagers they're like all very stereotypical they're kind of like I could I couldn't think of a name, but I think here it's like we have this whole like array of like vivid and well real real so well realized and like yeah very distinctive different characters like different teenagers having their own struggles and some of um and I and I was like really struck by that by like all those characters and um, and then like um just as a paparazzi I just from I just want to know from your point of view but like from your point of view both like as a person and also as an the author as the the creator of those characters so you could take either way and um, aside from Ren uh, who's your favorite character and who's your least favorite character and why oh uh favorite character would be would be Ren least favorite character would be Ren <laughs> no 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 sorry favorite character is S for sure um I think S is just a very like tender being. Mm, um, mm. Least favorite character would definitely be Ren because um, I think there's just like a lot of self-negotiation that she has to go through. Um, and there's a lot mm. of like, I'm, I'm very happy for her journey in the novel. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like it's hard being so angry and unhappy all the time. And I think to like follow her for 256 pages or however many pages there are, um, I do think like it might bring certain readers to a bad place, which is why it was very important for me to include a content warning um, in the beginning. Uh, mm. But yeah. And I do think your comment about um, the sort of like high school American aspect of it and there being like a kind of cast of characters like I never thought about like teenage sitcoms and high school etc but I suppose <laughs> like that is an aspect of it but I do think like as an author and as a writer and as an artist and a human being like translations and like international and diverse and just like having a diverse source of inspiration and artistic loves is very important to me which is like part of the reason why I asked if you would want to join a conversation and like just I think there was a diversity and sort of references that I pulled for this novel um just because yeah I don't I don't view the western canon as a canon I just view it as another place to read from um and mm -hmm. I do hope that comes through in the novel whether it's like a tradition untraditional timeline or um like the references that come through in the novel etc so yeah 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 I, I think that definitely came through in the sense and, um, you know, I kind of before I read um, this novel, I was reading Severance by Lin Ma. Mm -hmm. And and I think these two novels actually share a lot of similarity and most kind of inspire inspiringly, like to me as somebody, you know, who's from elsewhere and who kind of like I, I think for everybody is like uh, this is nowadays there's like an aspect of like, you know, um, an, an immigrant story in this novel and similarly in Severance, but at the same time. And that is not the dominant force. This is not the dominant thread. The narration and of 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 the story of the novel, and it has it it it's like it's it really just become like the the idea of like um like the immigrant parents and then coming from a different country. It just becomes like one aspect or like of like so many things that's happening in Ren's life, and. Um, and I think that's such a, it's such a like revolutionary, I, I know it's like, maybe it's because I haven't read enough novels by Americans, um, but I find that incredibly inspiring um, for the, for the, for the fact that, um, you know, nobody's like shouting, oh, this is like some different culture. It's kind of like everything is like very naturally just like happening in her life. And and I really like that it's almost like this, there's like this uh, democracy of it. It's like all of those things or like the equal and then they take turns kind of like, 
yeah so um i i i do like i was um i was very um i kind of was very jealous that Ren has such a cool mom <laughs> And again, like, I feel that's like atypical, if you know what I mean, like of this kind of like immigrant parents narrative and the fact like her dad, I don't know if that's like deliberately, like you kind of like, I want to subvert like the, 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 the stereotypes or that's just like something that naturally just came out. Like you were saying when you were working on this, it's like very, because oh it's like her dad had to go yeah. back to China to kind of make a living and to support them. I thought that was like, it's like a reverse. Like I think it was mentioned in the story a little bit. Said this. I thought it was so, it's that really quirky and like black yeah. humor, <laughs> but I also like, it's just so fun to have those like a tiny kind of um, subversion. <laughs> No, I I really appreciate you saying that. It it genuinely was a conscious choice to subvert the traditional parent. Mm. Um and I okay, I I can't be too honest on on the but I do think like seeing the reactions between like from Chinese people who read the parents to non-Asian people who read the parents there's a very different response. Um ah. And I, I will, I, I, again, don't think I should be too honest, but yeah, and I think you're exactly right. So thank you so much for saying that because it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah. Yes. No, I thought they were like, her mom was like super cool. I was like, I wish I had a mom like that. <laughs> uh, thank you for saying Jeremy that. Jeremy has asked a question, I think, <laughs> before we. Uh, I will read it. Uh, so we got from Jeremy. Thank you for the beautiful conversation. Jade, I was wondering what you think happens after the ending of the book, after her horrifying and triumphant transformation, has Ren found her true self, or is this one stage in a longer process of evolution and discovery? Ooh, whoa, thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, thank you for your excellent translations. Um, I think I think it's both. I think one can find their true self, but then Ren realizes that perhaps it's just one stage in a longer process of evolution and discovery. And I think that applies to being alive in general. One can think that their true self is the true self that they want to be, but then realize that later on that there are truer states of being that they seek. And that's okay. We're allowed freedom to change our minds, even though it seems like mm. we can't. Oh, that's so, that made me feel very hopeful that um, Kathy might also become a mermaid. So this is like my hope as like, <laughs> paparazzi I'm like oh I really hope Kathy's gonna become a mermaid as well and they're gonna like live it happily together <laughs> yes yes because <laughs> I was like, oh she's writing her all the letters maybe she's also going through something maybe she's gonna like this is like obviously me like being like a complete fangirl this is not like <laughs> but I was like, I really want them to be together please oh yes <laughs> Well, I think that's actually wrapping up the hour. Um, so I just really, really want to thank Jade first and foremost for writing such a wonderful book and being here with us today. And then uh, Yen for being here and moderating such a wonderful conversation that I learned so much just by listening to the two of y'all as well. Um, and of course, everybody who was able to attend, thank you for being here. It's really fun to have a conversation but it's always so much more fun when there's actually people here that are interested and excited to hear such wonderful speakers and authors i am going to remind you guys we have until tomorrow morning to buy the book so i have just dropped the event bright link so you can go and order your book in there as well and we will get it out to you coming in this next week and yeah i hope if you have any questions please email brookline booksmith and thank you guys all so much for coming